Hi, my name is Matt Edwards. I'm an associate professor of voice and voice pedagogy at Shenandoah Conservatory in Winchester, Virginia, where I am coordinator of musical theater voice and artistic director of the CCM Vocal Pedagogy Institute. I'm also on the board of directors for the Music Theater Educators Alliance, and I am the author of the book, So You Want to Sing Rock and Roll. Matt's asked me to put this video together to provide teachers with additional information that will help them adjudicate the music theater portion of the Nats student auditions. I've used the musical theater rubric along with several sources from musical theater literature and merged them together to provide you with about 40 minutes of training addressing respiration, alignment and posture, diction, musicianship and artistry on the six types of musical theater songs you are most likely to encounter in the audition room. We have a lot to cover, so let's get started. To guide this presentation, I'm going to be using the Nats Musical Theater Auditions rubric, which can be downloaded from Nats.org. The Nats guidelines specifically mention four categories, operetta, golden age, contemporary, and pop rock. While these are helpful, I think we can divide them up a bit more and give a better understanding of the differences between these styles. For this video, we are going to think about Golden Age of actually consisting of two subcategories. We have Golden Age Legit, which are those musicals that have a strong violin section. They're somewhat operatic in nature. The voices use a more acoustic resonance strategy, uh, similar to what you would hear in an operatic hall, just adapted for American musical theater. We are also going to be talking about Tin Pan Alley era songs. Those are songs that come from vaudeville traditions and come from the traditions of the Tin Pan Alley era writers from the 1920s who were working in New York City and were writing with a lot of jazz influence and a lot of their songs ended up becoming jazz standards. In the contemporary world, we're going to talk about contemporary legit, which are shows like Les Mis and Family of the Opera, as well as contemporary pop, shows like Dear Evan Hansen. In the pop category, we are going to talk about jukebox musicals. So those would be things like All Shook Up, Tommy, or Green Day's American Idiot, as well as musicals written by a pop rock artist. So that would be a show such as Waitress by Sarah Bareilles. We are going to begin by talking about tone. In traditional legit songs, the women are going to primarily be singing in more of a head dominant mix. These are songs such as If I Loved You, which were written in a time when microphones were not being used on the musical theater stage. In any contemporary production, the student would be wearing a microphone, but the microphone would not be at the corner of their mouth, but rather up on their forehead or somewhere in their hairline. This allows the microphone to pick up more of the natural acoustic beauty of the voice. The vocal quality is going to blend with the string instruments in the orchestra. We are going to find basically the same blending strategy in the men. They are also blending with the string orchestra. They're going to be singing in more of a chest dominant mix, something more akin to what you would see in operetta. And we are also going to find that they are acoustically projecting their voices as well. It is important when talking about traditional legit songs to acknowledge that tastes have changed significantly in the last 15 years. It's no longer acceptable for a singer to audition with an operatic sound on a golden age song in the professional industry throughout the United States. Instead, casting directors are looking for a sound that has more pop-like qualities in it. A great example is Laura Osnes singing Cinderella. The quality of the singers in a modern legit musical often have a lot in common with a Disney princess or a Disney prince. So we often consider this the Disney princess or the Disney prince sound. It's going to have less vibrato, vowels are going to be more speech-like, and there may be some pop stylisms involved. Let's take a listen at some examples of the way shows were sung legit when they were originally came out versus the way they're performed now. Oh, what a beautiful morning. Oh, what a beautiful day. Oh, what a beautiful morning. Oh, what a beautiful day. From China, he will bring you jade and perfume from Arabia. But don't forget, tis he who'll have the fun and the the baby. Oh, I hate men. From China, he will bring you jade and perfume from Arabia. But don't forget, tis he who'll have the fun and 
and thee the baby When I meet a lioness in her lair Then I'm glad to be back in my own little corner All alone in my own little chair In most Tin Pan Alley era songs, women are going to be singing with a speech-like quality and they are frequently going to belt. Now there are some exceptions, for instance, If I Were a Bell from Guys and Dolls. It kind of fluctuates between these speech-like qualities, some light belting, and some more legit qualities as well. As I said at the beginning of the video, there are many shades of gray, and we have to look at those little intricacies as you dive deeper and deeper into this work. Now in this era, there were occasionally microphones being used on the stage, but they were not yet on every single person on the stage. So the singers were singing with acoustically powerful voices. Luckily, they were only writing belt notes up around maybe B flat four to D five. They were not yet pushing women into the stratosphere that we see in modern musicals like Wicked. It is completely safe for women to be singing in this mode as long as they are not trying to push bigger sounds than their voice is capable of. The sound quality that you should expect from women is one as if it's related to calling. So for instance, if they were to say, hey taxi on a busy New York street, that is appropriate and that is safe. We would expect that their larynx might rise a little bit. When the larynx rises, it helps uniformly raise the form of frequencies in the voice, which gives an acoustical boost to make the voice slightly brighter without them constricting in the vocal folds or overpressing those vocal folds together to make that sound. In general, we want to listen to not whether if the vocal folds are in a too chesty of a mode, but rather if they're in a chesty mode without enough flow. Most of the time where singers get injured is when they start getting into pressed phonation instead of a little bit more of a flow phonation standard within their chest dominant singing. For men, we are going to find that they are going to also use more of a chest dominant vocal quality. They are not going to cover their high notes the way the traditional legit men would. And they are also going to allow their voices to blend with the brass and reed instruments in the orchestra just like the women will. Here's an example of a Tin Pan Alley era song. Olden days, a glimpse of stocking was looked on as something shocking, but now God knows that it ain't goes. Good authors, too, who once knew better words, now only use four letter words, writing prose. That it ain't goes. If driving fast cars, you like it, low bars, you like it, bold hymns, you like it, bare limbs, you like it, May West, you like, or me undressed, you like, or nobody will love. Every night the set that's smart is intruding in nudist parties in studios. Anything goes. In contemporary legit singing, we are going to find some of those traditional legit qualities, but with a lot more pop influence. This is also an era in which we are starting to see microphones appear on every single person on the stage. The first musical to have everyone body mic'd was Cats in 1981, and most of the musicals that fall into this contemporary legit category occur after the 80s with what many historians call the British Invasion. Women in this era are going to be singing in more of a chest mix to a head mix, depending on what part of their voice they're in and depending on the dramatic circumstances. Their voices can be somewhat acoustically powerful, however, since they are written to be performed on a microphone, there will be many very soft, subtle moments. However, with the microphone placed closer to the mouth, this is not going to be a problem in a live performance. In a competition, we would like those sounds to be as audible as possible, but it's not reasonable for them to project those soft sections at the same volume level as those high notes. In fact, trying to project some of those breathy, airy sounds that are common in this genre could actually produce 
hyperfunction and lead the singer to have some vocal problems. The men are also going to be living in mixed land. It's going to be a lighter mix than they would normally use in traditional legit in Tin Pan Alley era. They do sometimes use taller vowels to get some of that extra acoustic boost that gives that traditional legit feel. But again, they're not going to cover in the same way and it's going to have more of a pop-like feel, more of a hybrid effect. And unfortunately, as a baritone, I must say that baritone roles are relatively rare in contemporary legit shows. There are several of them in Les Mis, but if you go and look at the score, you'll realize the baritones in that show are expected to at least have an F-sharp, G, and in some cases an A. In contemporary legit songs, the composers often use synthesized instruments, and the singer's voice should be able to blend with those qualities. In order to blend, they are going to use different resonance strategies. There are going to be variations between more of a British ah sound and more of a French nasal o sound at times. And we are going to see a little bit more flexibility in the larynx than we might have seen in a traditional legit show. In traditional legit singing, if we are trying to maintain some consistent amount of forward placement or ring or buzz in the sound, a stable laryngeal position may help make that happen. Whereas in contemporary legit, if you are alternating between breathy singing, speech-like singing, acoustically powerful singing, and belting, that larynx is going to need to have a little bit more flexibility to make all of those qualities happen. Let's take a listen to a few examples of contemporary legit. Contemporary pop musicals, we see a merging of pop musical stylings with our traditional musical theater stylings. This started happening in the late 1960s and it continues through to today. And because we're dealing with such a large chunk of time, we are going to find a whole lot of variations. It's important to understand that throughout the history of musical theater, the composers have been playing around with new instrumental uh, innovations. So as synthesizers came onto the scene, people started composing with those, which then influenced the way that people sang. Nowadays, we have a lot of guitars and drum sets in the pit, which again influences the way that people sing. For both men and women, we are going to see basically every registration that you can imagine. Most of the time, they're going to be singing in a speech-like mix. They are rarely going to sing a legit sound. If they are singing a lot of legit, it's usually a contemporary legit song. If they occasionally pop it out as part of their character's choice in a contemporary pop song, it may be done in a comical way. Or if it is meant to be intentional, it's usually going to be in a much popular way, just like we see in those contemporary pop productions. For men, they are going to be singing very similarly to the women. They are not going to be covering their high notes. And for both men and women, we do not need an acoustically powerful sound because they are going to be performing with a microphone, most often somewhere on their cheek, which allows them to get away with those breathy sounds. In contemporary pop musicals, the actor is going to lead the way. Therefore, the voice needs to be free enough that when the performer makes their acting choices, their voice will follow along and provide a tone color that is appropriate to that acting choice. In order for that to happen, technically, the singer must have a free mechanism. They need to be able to move through multiple registrations. They should have a free tongue, a flexible soft palate, a flexible jaw, and flexible lips. Let's take a listen to an example of contemporary pop.
move on, I want to take a moment to talk about traditional belt versus modern belt. As I mentioned earlier, in traditional Tin Pan Alley style era songs, composers were only taking the woman's chest voice up to maybe a B flat 4 or a D5. There weren't really many teachers teaching that as a quality. There weren't many techniques for learning how to carry your chest voice up there. So it was very much an approach similar to calling. Women who could make those sounds would just belt it out, and it wasn't uncommon for people to tell belters not to take voice lessons so that they didn't lose that quality of their voice. As musical theater progressed, we started to see teachers and pedagogues starting to explore this work and coming up with techniques that were appropriate for that style of singing. At the same time, microphone technology was improving, and composers started taking advantage of those two things, and they started moving the women's voices higher and higher into their belt range. It's important, though, to notice that when they did this, the registration actually began to lighten up. They are able to do this because most microphones produce a 3 to 7 decibel boost in the forward placement zone of the singer's voice. So that little extra boost from the microphone will often make the voice sound like it's a one registration maybe heavier than it actually is. It also can be quite deceiving because sometimes we will hear a recording and think that the belter is really wailing and you know singing as loud as they can on that high note, but when you hear them in person you realize that the microphone is actually doing most of the work. If you want to learn more about some of these differences in belting techniques, I highly recommend picking up either the So You Want to Sing musical theater book or The Vocal Athlete by Wendy LeBourne and Marcy Rosenberg. Let's take a listen to a few examples of traditional versus modern belting styles. asked me to reiterate that belting is healthy and it can be done in a way that does not cause vocal harm. There are still students who receive feedback saying that they are going to hurt themselves by belting. In some cases that might be true because many students do end up doing what people in the business call screlting, which is a version of screaming and belting. And while that's not what people are looking for to get hired, many students think it is because of the confusion of how the microphone interacts with the system. So if a student is getting veiny, their face is turning red, they're losing their voice halfway through the song, it absolutely makes sense to say that yes, that belt voice could lead to some problems along the way. However, if 15 minutes later a student is still singing as clear as when they began, if they've been able to alternate between light breathy sounds, more classical legit sounds, as well as their contemporary belt sounds, it's very likely that they are doing everything perfectly fine and they are at no risk for damage. There are some sounds that may sound damaging, but are not damaging. In musical theater, there are some sounds that sound nasally, but they are not actually sending the sound through the nose. Rather, the vowel is so bright, it is producing frequencies in the same range as we typically hear nasality in a classical singer's voice. If you want to learn more about the safety uh, versus the dangers of belting and other vocal styles, be sure to check out Vocapedia and look through all the articles that our wonderful Nats volunteers have compiled for your reference. Under the new media. In pop rock musicals, everything is fair game. You're going to see all registrations present. You're going to see a lot of really breathy, really heady singing. You are going to hear more chesty singing. Sometimes people are going to drive their chest voice up higher than we would expect to hear in a contemporary pop song or a contemporary musical theater song. But it's important to know that, again, microphones play a big part in this. If you look at the singers or photographs of singers in most Broadway musicals in these pop rock styles, you're going to notice that the microphone is right up on the corner of the mouth. Many sounds that seem really, really harmful are actually rather quiet and the microphone is doing all of the work. Singers should not be abruptly flipping between head voice and chest voice unless it seems like that is part of their intention as an actor. If the song is too difficult for the student to be able to cleanly navigate jumps, then the student shouldn't be singing that piece. Men are also going to be exploring every registration within their voice. They're going to be predominantly singing in more of a chesty to heady mix. 
and some occasional excursions to falsetto. In pop rock songs, you're going to see basically anything you can imagine. Pop rock musicals are pushing the boundaries. We have now covered everything from country to hip hop, rap, heavy metal, and the list goes on and on and will only continue to expand. Because the styles are so diverse, you are going to see basically every registration, every vowel quality, and every volume level that you can imagine. Women are gonna be mainly singing in more of a speech-like mix with frequent excursions to a breathy tone quality. Men are going to usually be in a lighter version of a chesty mix to a heavier version of a heady mix. They may use falsetto and again breathy singing as well. It is important to remember that all of these songs were written to be performed on a microphone. The composers knew they were going to be using some form of a rock band in the pit and since a drum set can hit 130 decibels acoustically and singers cannot, there is no option for these singers to be heard other than using a microphone. In jukebox musicals, it's common for the singer to imitate the original artist's voice. If you're going in for Beautiful, the Carole King story, and you want to play Carole King, you need to be able to sound very, very close to the way that she sounds. On the other side, we do have singers who are expected to emulate for certain shows. So for instance, in Green Day's American Idiot, they're not looking for a replication of the voices of that group, but instead they're looking for people who can get their voices to emulate that sound. And then finally, in original pop rock shows, we are looking for a sound that is unique to that particular musical theater performer, but fits the stylistic traits required by the composer or the songwriter who wrote that song or that show. Now let's take a moment to review the Nats rubric and look at how these concepts I've introduced can apply to adjudicating. In the category of best, the Nats rubric says the singer shows mastery of the vocal technique required for all of their chosen selections and makes appropriate choices in keeping with the style and character. Changes in registration are smooth and even. In addition to those guidelines laid out in the rubric, you'll also want to make sure that if the student is singing a song that requires belting, that they are in fact belting. If the singer is performing a song that requires a strong acoustically powerful head voice, they should have a strong acoustically powerful head voice. However, you need to remember that they have the freedom to make the choice of singing it in a modern take on that song or of the traditional take on that song. So it would be possible for someone to come in and sing I Hate Men in the traditional way with the head dominant vocal production and then another student to come in and sing it in the contemporary way with the belt dominant production. Both of those examples could be considered acceptable as long as it seems like that was the student's choice and not something that they did because they just couldn't smooth their way through the register transitions. We want to watch out for excessive breathiness, excessive tension, and always please remember that things are subjective. There are no longer hard set in stone standards for musical theater performance. The way that the industry says it is that they're not looking for cookie cutters. They're looking for unique individuals who bring a different take to songs that have been performed for decades. So it's quite possible that your tonal goals are going to be different than your students' tonal goals and different than the students who you're adjudicating. If their voice seems free, if all their registration choices are smooth, but it's a little chestier or a little headier than you like, think to yourself whether or not it is within an acceptable window of possibilities. Is it something that would convince a casting team to call that student back for a callback to show them their flexibility? If it's within that window, then it would make sense for it to qualify as a best rating. If it's outside of that window is when we might want to consider a different rating. Students receiving an average rating are usually lacking in some of the evenness that we would expect from the best score set, and they're not always making appropriate choices for the style or the genre that they're performing. A few examples that fall outside of the Nats rubric would be a student who walks in with nasality that's not stylistically appropriate, a belt voice that leans too much towards head dominant mix but is close to being acceptable. Students should have a fairly consistent mix if they are singing contemporary repertoire, however, it might be somewhat weak at the extremes of chest and head. There might be moments where there's some residual breath in the tone quality, and there may be some visual tension. Now, a quick word on nasality. Nasality is used by a lot of contemporary voice teachers to help students find their speech-like mix. There's actually a scientific reason why this works. A slight valopharyngeal port opening actually helps reduce some of the pressure on the vocal folds and allows them to come into a mixed configuration in a way that is more productive than if the student is trying to keep a high British ah shape. 
So if the student has some consistent nasality throughout and it seems like their mixed voice is emerging, that's not necessarily a fault, but rather a symptom of where they are in their training. However, if it seems obvious that the student is really just disconnected, they're really still working on getting that nasality out, it may make sense to mention it. But it's worth considering that there are many teachers who do believe nasality is a valid training protocol for young belters and young musical theater performers. And it can be quite devastating if a student is told by another teacher that that sound quality is completely wrong and they have no business singing that way. The following criteria would justify a low rating for a student in the category of tone. If a student came in and showed little mastery of their vocal technique required for their chosen selections, barely made any appropriate choices in keeping with the style and the character, and was abruptly changing between registrations throughout, that would justify a category or rating of low in this category. Other things would be excessive residual breath in the tones throughout every piece that they sing, and a lot of excessive tension as well. Now let's move on to breathing and alignment. Classical ideas about posture and breath can apply to a traditional legit song if you are going to sing it in a traditional way. So for instance, plumb line posture, where you try to line your hips up over your ankles, shoulders over your hips, and ears over your shoulders, slightly tucks that chin, which then lowers the larynx and elongates the vocal tract. That may be acceptable in this style of singing if you are going for a warm, acoustically powerful sound. Lower diaphragmatic breathing or an apodjo style of breath could also be appropriate for these styles of shows since you are looking for an acoustic resonance strategy and you are also looking for a little bit of warmth which can be engaged via tracheal pole by a low diaphragmatic breath. However, that's where most of the classical tie-ins stop when we are looking at musical theater repertoire. In Tim Pan Alley style shows, many of the characters performing these songs are dancers. And so it's very common for them to put their body in more of a dancer pose or a dancer position while they perform. These characters are often comedic and they're not going to be standing still while they sing. You may see a lot of jazz hands along the way, which depending on your stylistic preferences could be considered appropriate or they may not be considered appropriate. The chin may rest a little bit higher than you would traditionally see in classical singing. A slightly raised chin position allows the larynx to rise, which gives you an acoustical boost that will allow you to make some of those belt sounds without having to constrict the side of the throat. Many of our dancers are very physically fit. It's not uncommon for them to have a six pack or an eight pack. And if they try to breathe into that low diaphragmatic position, they're going to meet resistance because their viscera cannot expand down and outwards because of the muscular contour they've developed. Therefore, in these singers, you're more likely to see lateral rib cage movement in a breath strategy that is based on the idea of maintaining rib cage expansion more than using their abdominal wall to increase flow or pressure. In contemporary legit, we are going to see a balance of some of those traditional ideals along with more of the casualness that we see cropping up in that Tin Pan Alley era. These shows are written to be very actor driven, so the expectation is as if the performer is in the middle of a crisis, they're not going to be standing in plumb line posture singing about it. Rather, we might see their physical posture slump a little bit. We might see them begin the song defeated and collapsed as they slowly try to lift their chest and face the circumstances and push through them as the song progresses. These singers often tend to be physically fit as well. And so again, we may not see as much lower abdominal expansion as we are going to see lateral ribcage expansion. Because many of these songs are written to be performed on microphone, using a little bit less air is going to be just fine because quieter sounds do not require the same amount of airflow and air pressure as powerful acoustic sounds do. So we don't want to see the singer heaving, we don't want to see their chest moving up and down, we don't want to hear audible breaths, but you may perceive that the student is not fully engaging their respiratory system to its maximum capability, and in some cases you could be correct, but that could be the teacher's goal because of the microphone component, the stylistic components, and the character choices that the performer has made. Contemporary pop shows deal with characters from a wide range of socioeconomic statuses. So in some shows, you might see a deal of formality in the posture, but in other shows, if they're dealing with people who are living on the street, such as in the musical Brooklyn, we are not going to expect to see plumb line posture. Those people are down and out on their luck. They're teenagers, young adults, who are living in a different physical world than you are going to see in upper society. 
So if their choices of, in terms of posture and alignment seem to represent the time period that that character is from and the socioeconomic status of that character, they would be appropriate even if they are not in that traditional plumb line posture. You're also going to see the breath is going to vary in this style as well. Again, because of the technical demands. If the student is singing breathy and they completely fill up the respiratory system, they're going to get excess pressure on their larynx, which is going to lead possibly to hyperfunction and eventually down the road, some sort of vocal injury or vocal fatigue. Again, we do not want to see tension in their breathing styles. We do not want to hear a lot of loud breathing, but we do need to somewhat think outside of the box because these characters are not our typical characters that we have seen in our earlier styles of musical theater. In pop rock musicals, everything is fair game. Again, we are dealing with people from different socioeconomic statuses. They are not thinking about conforming to society. Rock and roll is all about pushing the boundaries. And so the boundaries of posture, the way that they breathe are going to be all over the place. And if it doesn't look like it's causing tension, redness in their face, or any vocal fatigue, the choices are probably appropriate. Now let's talk about adjudicating breathing and alignment using the NAS Musical Theater rubric. If a student is to be awarded a score of best, Inhalation should be easy and sufficient all of the time. Exhalation should provide stability, support, and vocal energy. Alignment should be buoyant and appropriate for the character. Now, as we discussed throughout the last several slides, inhalation is going to vary among singers depending on their body type. So if a student breathes more laterally while another one breathes more abdominally, but both are breathing sufficiently and they are able to control their exhalation, then their breathing strategies would be appropriate even though they're different. If the student's inhalation is mostly easy and sufficient, their exhalation provides stability, support, and vocal energy some of the time, with some collapsing in the body at the ends of phrases, with buoyancy that is developing or somewhat appropriate for the character, a rating of average might be more appropriate. A student should only receive a rating of poor if inhalation is often insufficient, exhalation does not provide stability, and the singer tenses or collapses in the body. The singer requires extra breaths to complete phrases, Buoyancy is occasional or may not be appropriate for the character. Now let's talk about language and diction. In traditional legit songs, we can expect a level of formality in the diction. Many of the female characters would have been sent to finishing school somewhere along the way, where they have learned how to stand tall and how to speak like a lady, according to the standards of their time. Men were often involved in some form of military service, where again, they learned how to use their full voice, how to stand tall, and how to talk to others. If we have characters who come from more of a lower class setting, they are usually going to be singing the Tin Pan Alley style songs in the show. If they are singing legit though, they are going to be trying to usually conform to some of those legit ideals. In a Tin Pan Alley era song, the diction should resemble mid-American speech. Vowels should not be overly modified. We want it to sound like we are listening to someone speaking on pitch. Diction in contemporary legit style songs should resemble everyday speech. There may be slight modifications as the singer goes into the upper part of their range, whether that is to go into more of a traditional legit vocal quality, a contemporary legit vocal quality, or to belt. We also may see at some points there is a slight hint of nasality. Again, nasality can help with bridging the chest and the head register. And there are some teachers who have a tonal goal where a little bit of twang, what some teachers call nasality, is actually a desirable part of the end result. In contemporary pop, the vocals should resemble the kind of diction you would hear in everyday speech. They should not be overly modifying their vowels or their words except on the highest notes in their range. And again, there may be a slight nasality in the sound or twang, depending on what term you prefer. In pop rock songs, everything is fair game. If the student is singing a country western song, they may really draw out some of their diphthongs and triphthongs. If they're singing a rock song, they may use really de-energized vowels and a sound that has a little bit more nasality to it to fit the electric guitars that are underneath of them in the orchestration. Basically, as long as you can somewhat understand them and the choices they are making align with the acting choices they have made, it's probably acceptable. Here are some things to consider when judging the diction category on the NAS rubric. In order to earn a score of best, the text should be pronounced well, articulated easily as appropriate to the character all of the time. The singer should fully communicate the meanings of the lyrics. So to break this down a little bit more, Words should be intelligible. Diction may vary based on the genre. 
For instance, pronunciation of words in a country song should be different than those in a golden age legit piece. Students should bring out rhymes, alliterations, and onomatopoeias when appropriate, and the students should use vowel morphine appropriately in pop rock genres. Students who are somewhat inconsistent in the way they handle their diction are more likely to receive an average rating. So for instance, let's say the words are intelligible most of the time, but not all the time. Students might bring out some of the rhymes and alliterations and onomatopoeias when appropriate, but maybe not all of them. Vowel morphine may be used inappropriately, for instance, in a Golden Age song or a Tin Pan Alley song, or it may not be used consistently in their pop rock material. Now, when it does come to pop rock material, it's reasonable to be lenient on some of the diction if they're not going as far as they could. Not every student is going to come from a geographical region where training in pop rock musical theater is available to them. So it's really reasonable to expect that their legit and traditional and contemporary musical theater approach should be fairly appropriate. But if the pop rock seems a little too clean, it may just be that they haven't received that training yet. The lowest rating should be reserved for students whose diction is barely intelligible. So these are students who make a lot of mistakes throughout. They rarely, if ever, emphasize rhymes, alliterations, and onomatopoeias. For instance, they might use vowel morphine throughout Golden Age and Tin Pan Alley era styles. So this is hopefully going to be a rarer score that's going to be provided to students. And when it does happen, it's probably a student who is struggling in all of the other areas of the repertoire as well. In traditional legit shows, students need to stick to the notes that are on the page. Composers in that era wrote down what they wanted the singer to perform. They didn't want the singer taking a whole lot of liberties with it. Rhythm is there to help convey the meaning of the words, but maintaining a legato line is more appropriate in the end. Onsets and releases are always going to be clean in these traditional style songs. Vocal fry and aspirate onsets and releases are not appropriate. In Ten Pan Alley era songs, we are going to see a different use of rhythm. Whereas in traditional legit, we are thinking about vocal lines that are long and horizontal, in Ten Pan Alley era styles, we are thinking a little bit more vertically. This is so that the rhythm of the vocal line can really lock in to the rhythm of the accompaniment. Back phrasing and anticipations are acceptable. Oftentimes they are going to be written into the music. Onsets and releases are going to be usually clean, but scoops and occasional glottals are acceptable. In contemporary legit, we are not going to see quite the same formality as we saw in traditional legit. Some scooping is acceptable, but excessive stylisms are inappropriate. We are going to see mostly clean onsets and releases, although aspirates are acceptable if used expressively. And scooping is going to be more common than what we see in the Golden Age legit styles. In contemporary pop music, rhythm is extremely important as well. Riffing is acceptable, but should not be excessive. Onsets and releases may include clean, aspirate, glottal, and fry. Scoops, fall-offs, and leans are all important parts of these styles. In pop rock style songs, rhythm is of prime importance. These songs have to have a pulse that the singer is able to lock into. Onsets and releases are rarely clean. Fry, aspirate, glottal, onsets, and releases are all acceptable. You're also going to find that students are going to frequently scoop. They're going to use fall-offs on the end of phrases, they're going to lean into certain notes, and they're likely to riff. And riffing is completely acceptable as long as it does not become so excessive that you can no longer know what the original melody was intended to be. So now let's talk about scoring musicianship. If a student receives the best rating possible, it is because all pitches and rhythms are accurate. The markings of the music are observed and the style presented is idiomatic. Memorization is natural and complete. So to fill that in a little bit more with some of the ideas that we've been talking about, we would be looking for students who clearly understand how to use rhythm within each genre that they sing. They are going to be using anticipations, backphrasing, and syncopations, and making sure that those rhythmic features are clear when appropriate. They are going to possibly be adding in melodic interpolations or riffs, but they always need to be stylistically appropriate when used. And the onsets and releases should be stylistically appropriate for every genre that they sing. A score of average would be appropriate for a student who doesn't quite meet all of the objectives aligned in the best category. So for instance, students who demonstrate only some understanding of how to use rhythm within each genre. So for instance, they may not always observe anticipations and backphrasing, and they may not bring out syncopations. They might add riffs where they're not appropriate, for instance, in the song If I Loved You from Carousel. 
And onsets and releases may not always be appropriate. So for instance, they might be using some vocal fry and uh, if I were a bell, and then on the other side, they might be using clean onsets and releases and take me out tonight from rent. Again, it's reasonable to be more lenient in contemporary repertoire than in traditional repertoire because there are not coaches in every geographical area to be teaching this information to students. Students should only receive the lowest rating if they don't understand any of these basic concepts. So for instance, a student would walk into the room and show no understanding of how to use rhythm differently between the genres. They would use inappropriate riffs throughout all of their material. Onsets and releases would be inappropriate throughout. And finally, we come to artistry. Traditional legit songs convey idealistic life for the era in which they were written. The composers have taken great attention to detail in writing the melodic contour of the vocal line to help communicate some of the ideas. So actors need to pay close attention to clues from the melodic contour and how those can influence their acting choices. Gestures are likely to be a little bit more formal and refined in this era, and students are often going to have to deal with extended thought, which is when a sentence such as, if I loved you time and again, I would try to say, and instead of just saying it that quickly, they instead have to drag it out over the course of 8 to 12 measures. In Tin Pan Alley era, we also need to consider diction and musicianship as part of the artistry of the song. Composers in this era took great pride in the words that they came up with, and they want those to be conveyed. So when you are singing a Tin Pan Alley era song, you really need to bring out the cleverness of the rhymes. The diction needs to be clear enough that the audience can understand what the words are so they can catch those rhymes. A lot of composers will use onomatopoeias, so these are words that sound the way of the name that is associated with them, so sizzle, pop, crackle. We also want to pay attention to alliterations, a series of words that begin with the same consonants, such as cute, cuddly cats. Contemporary legit songs are not as idealistic as their traditional counterparts. The gestures are also going to be more contemporary. We're looking for more of a TV film style of acting in this repertoire. Students need to have clear acting choices that align with modern techniques, and most importantly, they should not fall into the trap of playing the problem. A lot of these songs are really emotional and students want to dwell in those emotions, but that drags the audience down with them. Instead, we want to see a student dealing, or a performer rather, dealing with a really intense emotional situation and trying to find a path forward to make their life better. In contemporary pop songs, realism is king. We want to see people living a real life on the stage, slightly heightened so that it does fill up the space you're in. There should be no excessive gesturing, indicating, or emoting. Standing still and just delivering the song is completely acceptable. Over-the-top acting is not. In pop rock style, singers should embody the feel of the song. If the piece has a clear storyline, they can approach it as an actor trying to talk to another person. But it's also acceptable in pop rock songs to just stand there and sing the song as if it was you telling your human experience through that song. Depending on the feel, large gestures and physical movements might be appropriate. So for instance, if you're singing a song from Rock of Ages where everything was larger than life, it would make sense to move a lot. But if you're trying to sing a song from Waitress such as She Used to Be Mine, you want a more natural, realistic point of view in the character or in the performer presenting that character. Now let's talk about scoring the category of artistry. For the category of best, we are looking for students who present a refined performance. The students should have made clear acting choices, meaning they clearly know who they are talking to, they know what they want, and they are changing their tactics throughout the course of the song to try to overcome obstacles presented to them in their pursuit of their objective. Acting styles should always be appropriate to the genre, and the gestures need to be motivated and appear to be organic, not choreographed. If a student cannot meet those standards, they may be more appropriately scored at the level of average. An average performance would consist of an actor or actress who has clearly made choices, but is not always clear with what those choices are. The acting style may not always be appropriate for the genre they are performing. So for instance, they might be putting large presentational gestures into a ballad such as, I'm not hurting from the last five years. And finally, we are probably going to see a lot of gestures that seem unmotivated or pre-planned slash choreographed. Students should only receive the lowest score if they are completely disconnected from themselves as an actor or an actress. 
These students don't know who they're talking to. They aren't making clear changes in tactics in their pursuit of their objective. And they either have no gestures at all or everything is choreographed and way over the top. I hope this video has helped illuminate some of the intricacies of musical theater performance that are not clearly delineated in the Nats Musical Theater category rubric. As I mentioned at the beginning, there are many, many shades of gray. There is a lot of subjectivity involved in all of this, but if we draw upon the resources that I cited at the beginning of this presentation, we can begin to unify the language that we are using to discuss musical theater performances and give our students a better experience at the NAPS auditions. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out and contact me at the email address below. Thank you for watching.